Hello, everybody. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're joining us from today. Uh, and welcome to today's webinar titled uh, The FDA Breakthrough Device Program Regulatory and Reimbursement Insights. It's great to see so many uh, people on the webinar uh, today. I hope that wherever you are joining us from, you're continuing to stay uh, safe and healthy and well. Uh, my name is Josh Downs. I'm Senior Vice President with LSX Leaders in London uh, and delighted to be hosting today's webinar, uh, the next in our medical device innovation series in partnership with Mukra. It's safe to say that the topic of today's webinar has generated significant interest and we're really looking forward to a great session today. Um, I will shortly be handing over to our expert speakers from Mukra, but uh, very briefly, while we wait for anyone joining a little bit late, and for any newcomers to us in this series, um, we at LSX are a community and network of executives in the life science and healthcare space. Uh, we work with CEOs from uh, medtech, health tech and biotech businesses, uh, big pharma and other commercial leaders, uh, and the full range of the investor base in life sciences as well, well as other key stakeholders. Uh, many may uh, know us from some of the uh, industry leading events, uh, conferences and partnering events that we run in Europe and the US. Uh, we hope to uh, be able to continue those physical events uh, as soon as possible, but delighted to still be connecting, informing, educating, and sharing expertise amongst our community in the interim. Um, so we're delighted to be working with, with Mukra um, for the latest in, in this series uh, of uh, medical technology innovation uh, webinars. You'll know Mukra as a leading advisory and research partner for medical device sector, um, and the firm has a wide and deep array of expertise, but today we are focusing in on two core areas of that expertise, uh, regulatory and reimbursement, and specifically around the FDA Breakthrough Device Program. So before I hand over um, to our, our speakers for today, uh, firstly, John Doucette, who is a recent former FDA policy lead who managed the Breakthrough Device Program, uh, Tonya Dowd and, and John McDermott. Uh, a couple of quick uh, points to mention from, uh, from me before we kick off. Uh, we will have the opportunity at the end of the presentation to put any questions that you might have to our speakers. So I would encourage you all to please make use of this time and to ask any questions that you may have um, using the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and um, as your application. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we'll look to get to, get to and answer as many as we can. If you do see a question that you wanted uh, to ask yourself that's already in the Q&A, you can also upvote for that question uh, to show that you're also interested in the answer and we can look to address those questions first. So please do use this function and ask any questions that you might have at any point throughout the session. Um, but that's it from me. And uh, it's my pleasure to, to hand you over to John Doucette from Mukra. John. So welcome everyone. Uh, so glad you could join us today. Um, my name's John Doucette. <laughs> I'm the Senior Director of Neurology Regulatory Affairs at Micra. Uh, before joining MICRA, as Josh said, I was the policy lead for the FDA's Breakthrough Device Program. Tanya and John? Hi, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tanya Dowd, and I'm the Vice President of Reimbursement, Health Economics, and Market Access here at MICRA. And I'm John McDermott. I'm Senior Director of Reimbursement Strategy here at MICRA. Great. So, John, again, uh, so I'm going to address the regulatory side of the Breakthrough Device Program. Uh, Tanya and John will then discuss the reimbursement side and then together uh, we'll answer your questions about both sides of the program. So first off, any runners out there, uh, even if you're not a runner, I think we'd all agree doing this would not be a good idea. And it's also not a good idea to start developing your reimbursement and market access plan after receiving FDA marketing authorization for your device. Early and integrating, integrated planning that blends regulatory, clinical study, and reimbursement considerations sets you up for both short and long-term success. And I'm fortunate to have joined a company that's built for this purpose. So MICRA is unique. We're a full service CRO, which considers the regulatory reimbursement clinical evidence, quality, and compliance requirements throughout a product's life cycle. <clears throat> we have world-class expertise in all these areas that work together, allowing our CRO to design and execute clinical studies that resonate with all relevant stakeholders, 
and most importantly, which bake in the commercialization plan and pathway into each step of the process. So many times when we first meet clients, they're usually thinking of a sequential strategy, plan A for regulatory, plan B for reimbursement. It's totally understandable. Very different decision makers, FDA, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, private payers, each have different requirements, ask for different kinds of evidence to meet statutory and payer criteria. However, this sequential strategy is high risk for the future viability of your company. For example, CMS has created special payment privileges for breakthrough devices, but you still need to apply. And none of these privileges exist today for private payers or for Medicaid patients. Best to think about questions like this one early in device development, even for breakthrough devices. Evidence generation, as we all know, is expensive. Optimal is least burdensome. An integrated plan that on the one hand recognizes the sequential nature of device development, and at the same time, bakes into each step considerations from the entire timeline is one that promotes generating the right information at the right time to the right stakeholders to meet their respective requirements. Okay, let me get off my soapbox and describe the FDA's breakthrough device program. So back in 2015, FDA leadership recognized that some devices are game changers because of new technology or because they treat patients with life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating conditions. And the early access pathway was created to devote additional attention and FDA resources to these particular devices. So the Congress said, great idea, FDA. We love this pilot program. So they wrote a law formalizing the Breakthrough Device Program and specifying some of its features such as the designation criteria. So FDA then issued guidance that described how to obtain the designation and how the program was going to be run. So here's one thing that you may not be obvious to those of you who haven't worked at the FDA. Guidance documents are written by FDA leaders, whereas the day-to-day -day execution of the program the, the uh, decisions about designation requests, the interactions about breakthrough devices, that's performed by staff. So my role as policy lead for the program in a nutshell was closing this gap between leadership and staff to ensure the program was being run in accordance with the rules and the purpose of the program. So the purpose of the breakthrough device program is to expedite patient access to breakthrough medical devices. And this happens in two major ways. First, it focuses FDA's attention on breakthrough devices by raising those submissions to the top of staff's and senior manager's to-do list. And it promotes collaboration between FDA and industry. Now, even though many interaction mechanisms is, exist today for all devices that support interactions with industry, FDA created new ones specifically for breakthrough devices and to expedite their development. Now, the only way to unlock access to them is to submit a breakthrough designation request and demonstrate that you meet the breakthrough device criteria. So a designation request can be submitted anytime prior to a marketing application. And I'm gonna describe the criteria for getting a designation in a moment. But for now, here's a list of the four new inter interaction mechanisms created solely for breakthrough devices to promote collaboration and expedite their development. They do that in several ways and I'm not gonna explain all of them today, but I just wanna focus on one in the next slide, which highlights an important one linked to the Sprint and DDP mechanisms. 
So consider the pre-submission timeline for a standard non-breakthrough device. So FDA will provide written feedback on content and questions no later than day 70 and hold a meeting five days later. So between day zero, when you submit your, uh, when they receive your submission and day 70, typically it's silence. So think if you were collaborating with someone and you could only talk to them every 75 days. It might take a while to get anything done, right? Well, the standard pre-submission process is not really set up for collaboration with the FDA. It's more for confirmation. In other words, you've done your research and you have a good idea about the testing requirements, endpoints, et cetera, but you're just looking to de-risk the situation and get confirmation from FDA that yes, you're right, you're going in the right direction. Now, consider the sprint or DDP timeline for a breakthrough device. You're talking to the FDA on day seven, and then it's back and forth over the next few weeks. So this is a timeline that promotes collaboration and identifying the right direction for a breakthrough device together. So it sounds like a great program with great benefits, right? So how do you get in? So here are the criteria that need to be met and that were written by Congress in order for a device to be designated breakthrough and access those special interaction mechanisms. You must meet criterion one and one of the subparts of criterion two. So criterion one is the most important. If you meet that one as a practical matter, you're gonna meet criterion two as well. So one important point about these criteria and the program that is often overlooked, you do not need to have some amazing new technology to be designated a breakthrough device. There was only one subpart of criterion two that even mentions technology and you don't have to meet it. The program is to promote devices that will have a breakthrough impact on public health, not solely those that have amazing new technology, unlike anything that's come before. So over the next few slides, I said criterion one is the most important. So we're gonna focus on criterion one um, and I'll focus on keywords in the statutory criterion in the first one and what FDA has said about how to interpret them. So FDA explained there needs to be a reasonable expectation that a device could provide for more effective treatment or diagnosis relative to current standard of care in the United States. So that's really important because it sets the bar your device needs to clear. So many of you may think, I know what standard of care is, but standard of care has a very specific meaning in the context of the breakthrough device program. For a medical product to be considered standard of care, it needs to have received a marketing authorization for the indication being considered. So no off-label use of medical products is considered in standard of care in the context of evaluating your breakthrough designation request. And second, the medical product has to be currently marketed in the United States and be a relevant option for patients with the identified disease or condition. So, but what does that mean? More effective than standard of care. So I'm not showing everything that FDA wrote about this in the guidance document, but actually the rest of the text, even if I showed it to you, it doesn't provide a specific definition. And that used to frustrate me when I would get questions from industry and staff, like what does it mean? In my opinion, now, you know, a year and a half later, <laughs> that's by design, that's by design. FDA wants industry and staff to think broadly about what it means for a device to provide more effective treatment or diagnosis versus standard of care. 
If FDA wanted to define effectiveness specifically, they would have done so. For example, for example, they could have cited the regulatory definition of effectiveness in the guidance document, but they didn't do that. So let me give you an example, a real simple one of a device that FDA might want to receive the breakthrough def, uh, designation. Consider if your device had similar or the same effectiveness as standard of care, but had features that allowed it to be accessed by a greater number of people. So think of a digital health product that could be worn or carried in your pocket. Even though the product might offer the same effectiveness as standard of care on some key clinical endpoints, the fact that more people can access the treatment or diagnostic would be a reasonable argument that it's more effective than standard of care in the context of the breakthrough device program. The point here is to think about public health impact when thinking about criterion one. So the last part of criterion one is frequently overlooked. You must specify a patient population that has a life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating condition. So FDA describes what those phrases mean in the guidance document. But the important point is that the patient population must be specified in your indications for use statement. If you're granted the designation, the letter you receive from the FDA specifies your device and the verbatim indications for use statement that you included in the designation request and the FDA will expect you to develop evidence to characterize the risks and benefits of the device in that specific breakthrough population. So what might that evidence generation plan look like specifically for planning what patients to include in your pivotal clinical study? So the green circle on the left represents the breakthrough patient population that you've been granted after FDA review of your designation request. So the larger circle to the right represents the pivotal study patient population. Notice that they don't have to be the same. The pivotal study uh, population can include patients that don't have life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating condition, but FDA will expect and press you to include the breakthrough population as shown in the figure. So consider the following important questions uh, for, the, for the team uh, designing this study. So to the regulatory uh, experts, a question might be, what percentage of the pivotal, pivotal study cohort needs to be from the breakthrough population in order for FDA to include them in our cleared or approved indications for use statement. In other words, for FDA to state, when you receive marketing authorization, we just cleared or approved a breakthrough device. To the clinical study experts on the team, how hard is it going to be to recruit breakthrough patients? How many sites do I need to enroll these patients at a reasonable rate? To the stats members of the clinical team, what percentage of the study cohort can be breakthrough without jeopardizing the potential for a successful study? And finally, to the reimbursement experts on the team, do coding, coverage, and payment pathways exist today for the breakthrough and non-breakthrough population? Are we generating the kinds of evidence that will unlock CMS spe special payment privileges for breakthrough devices? What will private payers think of the evidence we generate in this clinical study we're planning? Is it gonna be acceptable? The point is all these experts need to be at the table when designing your pivotal clinical study so that the results resonate with the key regulatory and reimbursement stakeholders. And that's MICRA's model when working with clients to design their clinical studies for breakthrough devices and all medical products. 
my final message is that optimal evidence generation is least burdensome. And that is achieved with early planning that blends regulatory and reimbursement considerations. My task for all of you when developing a breakthrough device is to ask yourself questions like these, even as early as when you're writing the indications for use statement for your breakthrough designation request. When you're writing that statement and you're making changes to address FDA concerns to receive the designation, you're making changes to your reimbursement strategy, whether you know it or not. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, John McDermott to talk about uh, reimbursement considerations for breakthrough devices. John? Okay, thank you, John. Thanks for the good setup. Um, actually, can you go to the next slide? So wouldn't it be nice if this were an entirely linear process where innovator companies started uh, with working with the FDA, trying to get their regulatory provis, sorry, regulatory approval set. And then after that was done, then they could move over to focusing on the reimbursement um, and get that set. And then, you know, everything is all set once you come to market. Um, and wouldn't it be even better if reimbursement were integrated into the breakthrough designation? But um, it doesn't work that way. And as John just said, ju as John just said, it does help to start both of those considerations, both the regulatory and the reimbursement early, including considering the reimbursement as you're deciding to pursue breakthrough. Uh, reimbursement can be a reason to do it, but it's not the only reason. Now, all that being said, there are some very real benefits um, from a reimbursement perspective when you do have breakthrough designation, and those come in the form of an expedited way of qualifying for new technology payments. And we'll go into great detail on those uh, next. So next slide. Okay, so let me provide just a little bit of background on reimbursement. When we're talking about reimbursement, we're really talking about three concepts. Uh, the first is coverage. And that talks about whether a service or device is eligible for payment by an insurance company. And that's where your evidence package comes in on the coverage side. The second is coding and coding describes how a device or procedure can be communicated to the insurance company for billing. And then the third is payment and payment refers to the payment methodology as well as the actual payment amounts. And I'm gonna cover coding and payment in my section. And then uh, when I turn it over to Tanya, she's gonna talk about coverage. Okay, next slide. Now, just a, a few additional background items here. In the US, when a procedure is done in a facility, that actually generates two bills. Uh, one bill is for the physician's professional fee, and the other bill is for the hospital or the ambulatory surgical center payment. And that's typically where the breakthrough device is being billed on the hospital side or the ASC side, and that's what I'm gonna focus on. So next slide. Now, under Medicare, the actual payment system is determined by the setting of care. So in the hospital inpatient setting, Medicare's payment system is called the Inpatient Prospective Payment System, or IPPS, and the payment method is called a Medicare Severity Diagnosis Related Group, or an MSDRG, and the codes that are used on the inpatient side are ICD-10 CM for diagnosis and ICD-10 PCS for procedure. Now, basically what a DRG is, it's a bundled payment that's meant to cover the entire cost of the hospitalization um, for each case. And the, the system is called prospective because the payments are set in advance and there are about 1,500 different payment groups, and the groups are customized for the type of procedure. So there may be cardiology or cardiac stenting groups, hip replacement groups, things like that. But whatever care a patient gets comes out of that single bundled payment that covers the whole hospitalization. 
Then if we look over at the ASC or the hospital outpatient side, there's a related but different system called the outpatient prospective payment system. And that has as its methodology, the ambulatory payment classification or the APC. And the coding is also different. Um, outpatient and ASC claims use CPT and HCPCS codes as well as uh, diagnosis codes. Now an APC is like a DRG um, in that it's, it is a bundled payment. However, on the outpatient side, a procedure can result in more than one payment. So you might, a procedure might be able to bill for and receive payment for two or three APCs versus on the inpatient side, it's just that single DRG payment. Okay, next slide. Now here's the problem with Medicare. Um, the way that they set rates um, for the current year is based on data from two years ago. So we're just entering the 2021 um, season. The inpatient rates are already um, updated for 2021. The outpatient rates will update January 1st. But those updates are based on data that was collected back in 2019. So typically, let's say that you launched your product um, non-breakthrough in 2019, then Medicare would collect those claims for a year. Then they would take a whole year through their regulatory process to analyze and propose the new rates. And only then do the, um, do the payments update to include the new technology. That's the problem is this long lead time to getting the payments updated. So what uh, Congress has established are uh, some technology add-on payments to get payment um, established for new technology sooner. And on the inpatient side, it can accelerate that two-year process by 21 months. So, um, you know, potentially three months after FDA approval, you could have um, an extra payment on the inpatient side. And then on the outpatient side, it can accelerate it by uh, just about the same 20 months. Um, so that's, that's one of the pathways that's available for um, new technologies. Okay, next slide. Now, the two pathways I'm talking about on the inpatient side, it's called new technology add-on payment or NTAP. And on the outpatient side, it's called transitional pass-through payment. And uh, they each have distinct requirements, but uh, some of them are, are similar. So for example, in both cases, the new technology has to demonstrate that it's new, meaning that it's not already included in the payment rates. Uh, the new technology also has to demonstrate substantial clinical improvement. So that's the body of the published literature and the clinical studies demonstrate an improvement over existing technologies. And then they both have to demonstrate a cost criteria. Um, now, one thing is very important. These are not included in the uh, breakthrough designation pathway. If you wanna pursue these, you have to apply for them um, on your own initiative directly to CMS. And on the, for NTAP, those applications are due once a year. Um, this year, it was October 16th. It's always in October. And if approved, NTAP would go into effect the following October. On the outpatient side for pass-through, you can apply for that quarterly. Um, you have to have your FDA uh, clearance or approval. And then the applications are due uh, one month before the start of a quarter for the following quarter. So a March application would result in pass-through payment approved in July. Um, so that's the cycle. And these are open to any new technologies uh, with the full applications here. Okay, next slide. Now, this is one of the most important slides in my section here. This is the benefit of having breakthrough. And the benefit is on the NTAP side, if you have breakthrough, CMS takes FDA's word that the technology is new and that the technology provides a substantial clinical improvement. So the NTAP application is streamlined and you only have to document uh, that you meet the cost criteria. Then on the outpatient side with transitional pass-through payment, you still have to meet the newness criteria, uh, but that's a relatively easy thing to do. 
Um, however, you do get the same benefit of not having to demonstrate substantial clinical improvement. You're already considered to have that um, by having breakthrough designation. And of course, you have to meet the cost criteria. So when you think about breakthrough, one of the things that you're getting is um, fewer hurdles and an easier route to qualifying for these very uh, valuable new technology payments. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna take a deeper look first at NTAP. Okay, next slide. And uh, we just went over this, but let's focus on cost. So in order to qualify for cost, the critical concept is that um, you have to show that payment is inadequate. And that's done on a, um, on a per case basis uh, when it comes time to um, granting the NTAP payment. And you also have to meet a cost threshold. So let me show you in more detail. Next slide. Okay, so this is how CMS determines whether the technology has meet the cost criteria. This is a, in the graph, that's the distribution of all charges within a DRG. And the red line is CMS's cost threshold, and that's set at three quarters of one standard deviation greater than the mean charge for all cases within the DRG. And what CMS wants, um, a technology to demonstrate is that the average charge for the technology cases or new technology cases is in the right tail. So to the right of the threshold. And the way you do that, um, you actually have to go and look in the Medicare claims data. So there's a file called MedPAR that has all of the hospital claims under Medicare. And you have to isolate the population that's um, who are candidates for your technology. And you do this by identifying ICD-10 diagnosis codes, ICD-10 procedure codes, and come up with um, your subgroup. And then you look at the average charge for that subgroup. That's step one. Then you, you go on and you model actually what the cost would be with your technology. So the first step is you remove the charges um, from your sub, subgroup analysis for technologies that you are replacing. You subtract those out, and then you go back and add in what you expect to be the charge, uh, the hospital charge for your new technology. You add that back in, and then this modeled amount is compared against that red line threshold. And if you come to the right of that in the distribution, then uh, you are likely to qualify for NTAP. And that's it. I mean, it, uh, it does require the claims analysis and it does require some research on other costs, uh, but it's not um, a terribly difficult analysis to do. Okay, next slide. Now, when it comes time to actually understanding what the payment amount is, um, you have to understand the, the test is, Oh, well, first of all, it's granted uh, um, on a case-by-case -case basis. So each claim that has an NTAP code is going to be evaluated to see if the hospital cost exceeds the MSDRG payment. So in my example below, let's say we have a new technology cost, and that's cost, not charge, a cost of $20,000 to the hospital, um, and the MSDRG payment is $25,000. So if the hospital cost for that case is 22, uh, in that example, it won't qualify for an NTAP payment for that case because the cost does not exceed the payment. But in the second example, the cost in this case is 35,000. So it does exceed the payment and it would qualify for an NTAP payment. Um, and so there's a deficit of $10,000. And so the payment is calculated on that difference. And if you look over on the right, the actual formula is 65% of the amount by which the cost exceeds the payment or $6,500 in this case, um, that's capped at 65% of the total cost of the technology. So if it's a $20,000 technology, the maximum available NTAP payment would be $13,000 even if the cost overage was $40,000 or $60,000, NTAP would only deliver 13. But that 13 is enough to modify hospital incentives and to ensure that they're gonna give great consideration to using 
um, a new technology. Okay, next slide. Um, NTAP expires after two to three years, and when it expires, then uh, the payment is rebundled into the DRGs. And finally, when you apply for NTAP, you also have to apply separately for an ICD-10 PCS procedure code. Um, it's not a difficult application, um, but there are, you can apply twice a year, once in December, once in June. There's a public meeting, and then the codes, if approved, go into effect about 10 months later. So that's a second step. You apply for NTAP in October, and then typically you would apply for an ICD-10 code um, in December. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now let's look at transitional pass-through. Next slide. Okay, so um, let's just talk very briefly about newness. So you do have to qualify for this, even if you're breakthrough. Newness means that you've received your FDA approval or clearance within the last three years, and also that you're not appropriately described by an existing device category that already has pass-through payment. Um, if you qualify for those two things, then you're considered to be new. And then on the cost side, there are three cost tests that you have to qualify for. Um, as we said earlier, you're exempt from substantial clinical improvement. Okay, next slide. Now, the cost tests uh, look kind of complicated, but I'll just walk you through what those are. So I have an example at the top of APC 5114 for knee arthroscopy, and that has a payment of 5981. And the first of the three tests is, oh, and my example is my, the, the hospital cost of the new technology is $3,000. So the first test is that the $3,000 has to be greater than 25% of the APC payment, which is 5981. So as you can see, it, it meets that test. Now there's a concept which is called device offset. And that is the portion of the APC payment that is already devoted to the device cost. So in our example, it's 36% of the 5981, which is 2184. So 2184 is already included for device costs. And the second test is the $3,000 has to exceed 25% of the device offset, which is only $546. So our technology meets that test also. Then the third test is the cost of the technology minus the device offset, so that's $816, has to exceed 10% of the payment, or 598. And it exceeds uh, that test as well. So our in our example here, the $3,000 device would qualify for pass-through on the uh, cost criteria. Okay, next slide. Now, we haven't talked about what the transitional pass-through payment is, and it's basically the cost or the hospital cost of the technology minus the device offset, or in this case, it would be an extra $816 for the hospital on the $3,000 um, new technology cost. And again, you know, that's a very nice benefit to the hospital. They normally wouldn't be getting that with um, other technologies that they're already using. So it's a, it's a very nice benefit, especially when you're first coming to market. Okay, then like NTAP, um, pass-through does expire after two to three years, and then um, the amounts are rebundled back into the APC payment and with presumably making the payment go higher. Okay, next slide. And the last thing, um, unlike in NTAP, where you have to apply separately for a code, when you apply for pass-through, the code is um, part of the application. So if you're successful um, um, getting transitional pass-through, CMS will issue you a HCPCS code, a HCPCS level two code that's called um, a C code, and it'll take the format of C then with four numbers after it. And the hospital would have to build that C code in order to get the uh, transitional pass-through payment. And um, so that's kind of a quick look there. So just a couple uh, closing items. So first of all, as I said, this is not an automatic part of breakthrough. 
you have to take your own initiative, establish contact with CMS and um, make your own applications. And that's something that we do at MICRA all the time. We'd be happy to help. Um, second of all, this is not meant to be, these payment routes are not meant to be a reward or an entitlement for innovators. What they really are set up to be is stop loss payments to hospitals. That's why you have to qualify under the cost criteria to show that the hospital payment otherwise would be inadequate. And therefore, one, one good way to, to have um, inadequate payment for the hospital is for you to be on the expensive side. So whether it's an expensive hospitalization for NTAP or if it's an expensive device cost under transitional pass-through, that's one of the keys um, to qualify. So with that, um, let me turn it over to Tanya for a look at coverage. Thank you, John and John, appreciate that. Um, so we've talked about payment and coding in particular for um, new breakthrough devices. Let's turn our attention now to the real key fundamental um, component of reimbursement and that is coverage. And that's essentially the means by which payers, both commercial and Medicare payers and Medicaid and other payers, look to determine if a technology is reasonable and necessary or medically necessary for a certain patient population and under specific conditions. Next slide. So there are two essentially um, main mechanisms by Medicare to provide coverage for uh, technology, services, devices, and procedures. Um, it's the, one is the national coverage decision mechanism and that is through CMS. And so coverage is granted for procedures and technologies, again, that meet the reasonable and necessary criteria. This is not the norm of, of the way that technologies are covered um, and is rather the exception essentially and used really for high profile, high impact controversial technologies such as TAVR, the Edwards TAVR device or Levanova's VNS therapy. Um, oftentimes these, the NCDs are met with a requirement to do a coverage with evidence development protocol. So that includes oftentimes a registry. Um, and these decisions are binding on all Medicare contractors or MACs and typically take about nine to 12 months to establish. Um, the other way that, that Medicare covers technologies formally is through the local coverage decisions or LCDs, again, through one of the 12 MACs across the country. And the Medicare contractors are those entities that manage and, um, and finance, if you will, the, the Medicare program across the country. So max establish local coverage decisions, again, based on technologies that are reasonable and necessary and meet that criteria. And oftentimes the MAC policies differ across, across um, regions. So one MAC may have a coverage policy that's positive for a technology, whereas another MAC across the country may have uh, one that's negative. So there definitely are, there's a lot of inconsistencies that exist. And in the absence of any type of formal coverage policy, either through an NCD or an LCD, um, te the technologies, procedures, and devices are actually reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis when the claim comes in um, for de to determine whether or not they're reasonable and necessary and covered. Next slide, John. So to really kind of resolve the issue of the, the timeframes that exist for NCDs and the inconsistencies that currently exist for, Medic for LCDs, um, CMS recently published a proposed rule known as the Medicare Coverage of Innovative Technology Rule, and it's a proposed rule, otherwise known as the MSIT, and it was published um, in the latter part of August. And the propo proposal essentially seeks to fast track coverage through the MSIT pathway for devices that have already secured FDA breakthrough status and that are already received a market authorization through FDA. The rule also seeks to codify the definition of reasonable and necessary, and you heard me mention those two terms a few minutes ago, for Medicare coverage determinations, and then that way that they will consider one of the CMS coverage requirements to be met for an item or service if it is currently covered under commercial payer policies. Um, the time frame by which they're proposing uh, this rule is that they would provide immediate coverage for again devices that receive breakthrough status for a period of four years 
So essentially the coverage would be established and in place for four years. And what happens when this, this coverage ends? The breakthrough device would be subject to one of the following, the NCD, a positive NCD national coverage decision. Again, that's, that's binding on all the MACs. Um, a non-coverage decision. So basically it's, it's negative coverage, again, binding on all the MACs um, or MAC discretion. So on a claim by claim adjudication. Next slide. So there are some key, um, key considerations for manufacturers. And first and foremost, again, because the MSIT is in a proposed state, there are several unanswered questions, um, especially in how this is going to be operationalized. Um, the FDA marketing authorization, again, must be established and breakthrough devices must be used for the FDA approved or cleared indication. So in other words, the MSIT will only apply for that device's cleared or approved indication. Um, the program is voluntary. Um, it's, an, it's initiated when a manufacturer notifies CMS of its intention to utilize the MSIT pathway. So just because you have a, um, a technology that's breakthrough and just because you might have NTAP or a transitional pass-through payment, you don't necessarily have to go through the MSIT pathway. So again, going from that co coverage coding and payment three interrelated concepts, very important to keep in mind. And I think the third piece that's really a, a, um, a, um, a primary consideration for manufacturers is although CMS is not mandating that manufacturers who, um, who go through the MSIP process and have coverage for that four year period, they're not mandating that evidence be generated during that time, um, there's an inherent, I think, requirement that manufacturers do continue to generate evidence during that four-year time frame, especially as if we think about what happens after that four-year period ends, and also especially if we think about what what uh, commercial payers will be looking at in terms of coverage policies. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, make that note in just a second. But again, because there are so many unanswered questions, and um, and you know, and and I think opinions of how this should be rolled out and operationalized. Uh, CMS is seeking comments that are due next week, November 2nd. And so we encourage any stakeholder and industry to really read through the rule, the proposed rule, determine how it may impact them and submit comments by that time. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that you know a major consideration here is the evidence that the technology will need for coverage aside from Medicare. So let's think about the commercial payer criteria. And, um, and if your technology has a big commercial payer base, you definitely want to make sure that, that you meet the criteria that's generally in place for commercial payers to make positive decisions. And I would say first and foremost, you know, really looking at does, how does the technology impact positively patient outcomes or as, as opposed to the established alternatives or the standard of care. So it's really, really important to think about your end-to-end -end evidence generation strategy, as John Doucette mentioned earlier, from, from beginning to end to support the coverage piece, again, the most foundational and, and important piece of reimbursement. Um, next slide. So just to kind of go over some key takeaways from the presentation today, um, to reiterate some things, new technology payment under Medicare is not a reward for breakthrough devices uh, or an entitlement for innovators. It is essentially a stop loss payment mechanism for hospitals. Breakthrough devices must still qualify for payment, but have the benefit of being exempt from newness and or substantial clinical improvement criteria for NTAP and transitional pass-through payment. And having higher costs compared to the rest of the, of the cases within an MSDRG or the rest of the devices within an APC is key to meeting that cost criterion. And that's why we always say, think about this early, early on in your clinical evidence strategy and in the regulatory process. Um, MSIT is, a, is again in a proposed state and comments to CMS from interested, interested stakeholders um, is imperative and, and certainly in court encouraged. And coverage through MSIT is temporary and will not guarantee coverage with commercial payers, with Medicaid agencies or other payers, nor will it guarantee cover, continued coverage with CMS once that four-year period is over. 
The next slide. So we put together some, just some, you know, brief benefits and challenges from a reimbursement and regulatory standpoint. Obviously for breakthrough devices, the benefits are the, um, the NTAP and the transitional pass-through payment, as well as the proposed MSIP coverage. I think some of the assumptions that we can, again, look at as challenges are, we should not assume that a breakthrough status automatically equals coverage and payment. And as we've learned today, technologies must still meet specific criteria. And I'll hand it over to John Doucette to, um, to talk about the regulatory benefits and challenges. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. So um, mentioned some of these before, special interaction mechanisms created to interact with FDA. Um, so to promote collaboration and speed and focus. The one thing I want to say, it give you a little peek behind the curtain at the FDA, that breakthrough label is so key. So when you think about it, just to give you some numbers, over the last five years, um, you know, about four, we're at, uh, FDA has uh, designated breakthrough for about 400 devices. Over that same period, there have been thousands of 510Ks that have been cleared. Let me tell you, when a breakthrough device 510K shows up on a doorstep, the very top leadership of the FDA knows it's shown up. And think about your own companies. If the CEO of the company knows about something and, and wants something to go fast, it, it happens. So, you know, the same thing inside the FDA, you want that label. Um, the challenge is the novelty. You know, FDA, it's intrinsic to the place. It's a regulatory agency. It's built for stability. A mentor of mine at the FDA uh, one time said to me that FDA is like an ocean liner going down the ocean. It's tough to make a sharp left or a sharp right. Um, and at the same time, that's why the breakthrough program was created. Uh, these devices are too important. Uh, and we need to focus and, and need more speed than, than is typical for uh, a regulatory agency. So um, let me go to the next slide. So uh, we have some questions that were, we obtained beforehand or that just frequently are asked and we're just gonna go through these. Uh, the first one is, does the chosen approval route 510K PMA in combination with uh, FDA breakthrough device designation have implications on the request for NTAP or TPT, and what are the considerations for coverage? So John or Tanya? Yeah, I guess I'll go. So um, I, I think one thing, um, well, there, there's an, a bit of an equalizer here on the, um, the technology add-on payment applications. So they're not specifically looking at, is it a 510K or is it a PMA? So if you have a 510K device, you have potentially the same shot at qualifying. Uh, it's, you really have to look more at, the, um, at those cost tests. Um, you know, so in other words, I don't think that the chosen approval route necessarily makes that big of a difference. Yeah, I think, I think in terms of, of coverage, you know, um, special consideration should be given to that, uh, to that piece. Again, I'll not get on my soapbox, but it is the, one of the most important pieces of the reimbursement concepts is since the evidence requirement for a 510K are minimal essentially or nil, um, you know, and there's minimal lack of data um, that would be required, you do need to pay attention to that for coverage from the third party payers, again, post approval. Thanks. Um, so the next question that we typically comes up, does the FDA breakthrough device designation influence the assignment of category A or B to IDE upcoming studies? So I'm going to make do this uh, briefly because I want to get to your questions uh, from the audience. The short answer is no direct influence. Um, it doesn't matter if you have a breakthrough designation the categorization uh, of A or B by FDA when they approve your IDE, it, it really has no influence of whether or not you're, you're designated as a breakthrough device. Um, so the last question, before getting to your questions from now, 
How can a device cleared under a 510K be considered breakthrough? It seems counterintuitive. So um, before answering, let, let's just take a step back and consider what devices are eligible for the 510K pathway. So to be eligible, device has to have the same intended use as a predicate, and any differences in technology cannot raise different questions of safety and effectiveness. So a breakthrough device might have a different indications for use statement when compared to a predicate, but it might have the same intended use as the predicate and therefore be eligible for the 510K. And a breakthrough device also might have different technology when compared to a predicate, but the differences might not raise different questions and thus be eligible for 510K. So the 510K pathway is built to be flexible and it can handle certain kinds of breakthrough devices. Now, you know, having said that, most of the devices granted the designation while I was at the FDA, they were heading towards de novo uh, and PMA pathways for sure, but not all. Um, so want to get to your questions. And before then, just want to say thank you to everyone for attending. And um, now would love to hear your questions. Thanks so much, John, uh, and, uh, and and John McDermott and Tonya as well. Um, excellent presentation. Um, we actually have a, a huge number of questions through, which uh, just shows uh, the, the interest in, in this topic and, and uh, a lot of the things that you presented. Um, just uh, so everyone's aware, obviously, that the webinar was, uh, is due to close in, in a few minutes' time, so it's a, we, we kind of run a little bit, and uh, we will get to, to a number of these questions. Um, any questions that we don't get through, I will be providing um, all of the, the, the questions through to um, the, the Mukra team, um, and then they'll be able to follow up with you and answer your questions if we don't aren't able to get to it. Um, because yeah, we we have uh, yeah approaching thirty questions here, which is going to be uh, impossible for us to to reach in the time. Um, Please, uh, yeah, I, I'm obviously not an expert in the, in the subject myself. So if any of these uh, have been sort of covered in uh, in some detail somewhere else early on, then then do let me know. Um, but maybe just starting off with the first question that was asked by uh, Elizabeth Monroe. So the question was, in your experience, does FDA typically meet the timeline targets for sprints for breakthrough devices? Um, Pre-sub timeline targets aren't always adhered to, particularly during COVID-19. Yeah, so I'm not sure how to address the COVID-19. I'm sure, as you know, the FDA is overwhelmed right now with uh, EUAs and, and everything having to do with, with that, but they do their best to meet sprint uh, timelines. Yes, they do meet sprint timelines if the sprint submission is aligned with the guidance document description of a sprint. So what I've seen some companies do, they, they get a breakthrough, they submit a sprint, but it's like a thousand pages long. It has nothing to do or it's not aligned with the definition of a sprint being one topic, one goal. So if you submit a huge amount bolus of information to the FDA, they probably are not going to be able to meet that very uh, back and forth, seven days, 14 days sprint timeline. However, if you do align with the uh, guidance document uh, information, they more often than not are gonna meet that sprint timeline with you. That's the goal, expedite access to breakthrough devices and the sprint mechanism is key. Excellent. Um, and uh, yeah, I think another a question here from, from Angela Smalley. Um, how will coverage be available for breakthrough digital therapeutics that don't have a CMS benefit category? I'll take that one. Um, you know, remote patient monitoring devices or digital devices um, are eligible uh, for coverage under the MSIT if they do have um, breakthrough status. However, the benefit category for digital health devices is not clearly defined by Medicare. And, um, you know, industry should be seeking clarification from CMS on a, you know, on a clear definition for an, R, an RPM category, uh, again, in their comments and in the context of the MSIT proposal? That's a great question. Excellent. Um, this one uh, is, is from an anonymous attendee and, and maybe uh, hard to, to give full figures, but a, a rough estimate. Um, if you could provide a rough estimate for the cost of taking a device through the breakthrough designation route, um, including, for example, the cost of engaging with, uh, with an expert advisor like Mukra. <laughs> If that's something you are able to ask. John can take that one. <laughs> John, do that. 
<laughs> Maybe we should take that one offline. Yeah, OK, all right. Cool. That sounds good. <laughs> No problem okay, there. Whoever yeah. asked that question, it was an anonymous attendee, but um, yeah, please do do send me a, a message in there and we can connect uh, can connect offline on that one. Yeah, I think it's variable for sure. That would be my my answer. Case by case. That's right. Uh, so we have a, a question here from, from Peter Ruff. So um, we have three clinical studies in Europe showing a real life, uh, showing real life evidence, being able to triage patients at the beginning uh, and removing 60% of patients from referral for further examination. Will such a test qualify as, uh, as breakthrough device? Uh, do we need an additional study in the US? You don't need an actual uh, to do a study in the US. OUS data is perfectly acceptable to support a breakthrough device designation request. You, you would, let me just say from a reimbursement standpoint, you would need US data um, for, again, commercial payer coverage and continued coverage with Medicare as in addition to if there was a unique coding pathway that you were going down um, with CPT. I know we didn't talk a lot about that today, but you need a US patient population study. Excellent. Uh, and Cliff uh, Amsel um, asked if you could comment on how things differ for DME equipment and codes. So let me start with that one and maybe Tiny can chime in. So the, um, the pathways that we talked about were only for inpatient hospital and outpatient or ASC. So if if the DME can be used within those settings and build under those payment systems, then there's no problem. But there is no existing um, NTAP or pass-through category for um, services that are billed under the Medicare DME benefit. That, that doesn't exist as of today. I think I'll, I'll turn it to John Doucette and ask, you know, what is the eligibility criteria for DME and does that meet, uh, can, it, can a DME have a breakthrough status. What's a DMA? What's that? <laughs> durable medical durable medical equipment. Yeah, um, you know, I don't think there's any special category uh, or or criteria or uh, for for a durable medical equipment. They would need to meet the same criteria. It would be the same process as any other device. Um, and, and you would submit a designation request, and you'd get a response within sixty days. There's just no particular yes or no to that category of devices. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and, a, and a very recent question. Um, can you provide any guidance on what qualifies as life-threatening conditions to qualify for uh, BDD? So for example, um, would a device that prevents falls in the elderly qualify as a uh, fall uh, leading to, uh, is a leading cause of death in the elderly? Yeah, so the guidance document actually does a very nice job of defining what is meant by life-threatening. And as people, unless you interrupt the course of the disease or condition, that it's very likely that they're going to die at, you know, very, very soon. So they're, they're, they're trending downhill. So someone who uh, might uh, experience a fall, that's probably not going to qualify as life-threatening. In the context of a breakthrough designation request, again, I would refer you to the guidance document for the spe specific definition and guidance about what's meant by that. But in a nutshell, uh, a fall, probably not. Okay. Uh, and Steve Davis has asked, how often are breakthrough devices rejected uh, as, a, as a sort of rough percentage? Uh, and what yeah. would you say are the main reasons or uh, why they're rejected usually? Yep. So uh, about 40% are rejected. So that's pretty good. 60% success rate. 40% um, are rejected. I would say about 30% of the rejections are due to indications for use statement. FDA and the sponsor never get on the same page with who the patient population is, which is amazing, but it, that happens. They never define a, a patient population with a life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating condition. And then the other uh, probably 60 to 70 percent is the evidence accumulated thus far or presented, that be that literature, bench, animal, or maybe even some pilot clinical data to support reasonable expectation 
that you're going to be more effective than standard of care. It's just not there. In other words, um, you know, it's not predictive or the FDA doesn't buy that there's a reasonable expectation it's going to be more effective. So, you know, seven out of 10 due to the evidence, three out of 10 due to the IFU statement. And, and uh, Joanna Zylas has asked, if your new technology fits within a coding paradigm already established, does CMS confirm that that equivalence with you? I'll start with that one. It depends on the actual coding assignment we're talking about. CMS manages two different coding pathways, the ICD-10 procedure codes and HCPCS codes, whereas the AMA CPT, the American Medical Association CPT manages CPT codes. So um, I think the, the answer is a little bit more involved, um, but it really depends on the coding, the coding pathway. And then the payment mechanisms differ. Again, as John McDermott mentioned, the physicians receive a certain payment and the hospital receives a specific payment separately. And depending on what care setting, inpatient or outpatient, that would differ. So I think the answer is a little bit more um, detailed. John, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I don't know that they would actually confirm a code for you. You can talk to them about the process for applying for a new code, but I don't believe they would consider themselves to be in the advice giving business. Um, now, that being said, you know, you can submit applications or um, have discussions with them in advance of submitting those about what the process would be. But it's not the situation where you can call up and say, um, I have this code. Will that code work? I don't think they would answer that question. Yeah. And if you wanted to validate the CPT code, you'd need to go to the specialty society um, that would manage that code set and determine if you could use that coding construct for your technology. Um, we, uh, I think, maybe have time for, for maybe doing a couple more questions, um, but they do keep rolling in. So, uh, I, yeah, we, we'll probably end up uh, uh, staying here till uh, till the end of the day, US time, uh, if, we, if we if we continued. Um, I will make sure to to keep um, keep all of these. As I said, we will be sending over the the recording of the presentation. We'll be sending over um, the the slide deck, and we'll also be sharing these questions with the team at Mukra. And I'm sure they'll be very happy to to talk to you offline and and, uh, and answer some of these questions if we if we haven't got to them. Um, so I'll pick a last couple before we uh, we close off the webinar today. Um, uh, one from, from Martina Petkoff. Um, is there a publicly available FDA database for devices that are part of the Breakthrough Device Program? Yeah, I used to get that question about, I would say about six times a week. I mean, I know it doesn't, it makes, uh, no, the answer is no. Um, I think the, the, the way FDA thinks about it is, when a company, this is pre-market, they haven't submitted a marketing application, it's proprietary information. That's the way they FDA views the breakthrough designation requests and even the receipt of the breakthrough designation. Now, having said that, most companies do pretty quickly turn around and broadcast that they've received a designation as a breakthrough device, but there is no publicly available database. Okay, perfect. Um, and yeah, to, to pick one last uh, question, uh, but before we before we sign off here, um, so uh, Jeff Withrow has asked, um, when no coding pathway exists for a new technology, can you still satisfy the cost criteria required for NTAP or must see or uh, oh sorry or must you use an equivalent code? Uh, so could you not, yeah. read that? I missed the first part of that. Could you re repeat that, Josh? It was quite an elaborate question. It was so uh, where no coding pathway exists for a new technology, can you still satisfy the cost criteria required for NTAP or must you use an equivalent code? Well, OK, so with NTAP, you're applying before your new technology is on the market. Um, that's why you can accelerate payment by that 21 months. So you don't you know, you don't have to be on the market for your technology. And that's where that claims. Um, analysis comes in with the MedPAR file. So you have to do just the best you can um, if, you have, if you're treating an established condition, so maybe not some new disease, you can go and pull the diagnosis codes you know, for that disease. And then you try to model what those patients are currently getting with standard of care through procedure codes. 
and what you're basically doing is you're getting the subpopulation of people within each DRG who are going to be candidates for your technology. So they're, they're already being treated with standard of care. So there should be coding to identify them. Then, as I mentioned, then you come up with estimates of the costs that you're, of the technologies you're replacing and you strip those out and then you add yours in. So you don't have to have codes for your technology. Um, as long as you can identify standard of care, then you can model um, what the projected cost with your technology could be. Fantastic. Well, we, with that, as I said, as we're uh, already well over, um, and uh, yeah, a huge thank you to, to, to John, John and Tonya for um, sharing their expertise and insights with you all. Um, uh, we'll, I'll, we'll follow up uh, tomorrow with uh, that link to the presentation and, and the slides, uh, and also share these additional questions uh, with you and, and the Mukra team, um, so that you can follow up and, and have some of these answered. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully there are a number of you out there who um, are yeah uh, able to, to, to go through this program and, and work with Mukra to um uh, to get your devices uh, through the program so um a huge thank you to to, to all of the speakers today and to mukra uh, for being a partner with us for this uh, ongoing medical innovation series um if you have any uh, further questions or uh, anything else that uh, i can help with or, or connect with mukra then uh, please just uh, send me uh, an email uh, to josh at lsxleaders.com and I'll, I'll be sure to uh, coordinate and help as well so thank you very much uh, wherever you're joining us from, if it's the end of your day or uh, just beginning, um, and hope to see you again on the next one soon. Uh, thank you, John, thank you. John and Tanya. Thank, thank you, you, Josh. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Josh. Thank you.